and uh, we'll bring the next speaker up and get you ready for lunch very soon. Don't leave, don't leave, just stretch. <laughs> don't leave. That is my way, by the way, of being service friendly to all of you, something for which our next speaker can claim great expertise. The published papers alone of Dr. Leonard Berry caused my printer to hyperventilate. That was just printing 40 pages of titles of things that he's written. He is a specialist in business marketing and he's passionate about quality service. His half a dozen books focus on competing through quality, healthcare service and marketing, and on the hot topic today, confronting the healthcare crisis. He's also joining us today from his post as professor of marketing at Texas A&M. Please welcome Dr. Leonard Berry. Good morning. Healthcare in America is sick. It's very ill. Incredibly smart, talented, and dedicated people work in healthcare, but the system in which they work is seriously flawed. It costs too much, it wastes too much, it errs too much, it discriminates too much. As currently structured, our healthcare system is unsustainable. America spends more than $2 trillion a year on health care, about 16% of our GDP. The cost of health care is undermining the fiscal viability of individual households, of employers that offer health benefits, of state governments, and of our federal government. Nor are we getting a good return on our investment. The U.S. spends far more per capita on health care than any other industrialized country, and yet new research reveals that the U.S. ranks last among 19 industrialized countries on preventing deaths from treatable conditions. We can do better. We can vastly improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our health care system, but doing so will require courageous leadership inside and outside of health care, far better communication and cooperation among the various stakeholders, and the willingness to change some of our fundamental precepts. Like the other speakers, I have 20 minutes, so I can't cover all the issues or discuss them in depth. I picked four topics, four important issues, each an essential premise for improving healthcare performance. Premise number one, individuals must be responsible for the lifestyle choices they make that affect their health. Wellness cannot be delegated. Responsibility for health begins with each individual, a message that was brought forth so well by Dr. Lodge this morning. A recent study published in a leading health journal estimated that approximately 40% of deaths in the U.S. are caused by modifiable, modifiable behavior patterns such as poor diet, physical inactivity, smoking, alcohol abuse, and poor coping strategies for stress. According to this study, Lifestyle is the leading underlying cause of illness and death. Lifestyle. One example is the obesity epidemic. Obesity, as you know, is a major risk factor for various medical conditions, including hypertension, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. Children represent more than 30% of new cases of type 2 diabetes children, a condition rarely seen in children prior to the obesity epidemic. To be sure, food manufacturers, restaurants, ineffective government intervention, medical inattention, all are complicit in the obesity epidemic. 
Yet maintaining a healthy weight begins with each individual taking control of their health, as Dr. Lodge reminded us this morning. Taking control of their health by eating smaller portions, eating healthier food, and engaging in more physical activity. Smart lifestyle choices. Smart lifestyle choices are a key component of improving the healthcare system in our country. It requires personal discipline. It requires education on the health risks of certain behaviors. It requires access to affordable, healthy food. It requires the opportunity to be physically active, an opportunity that not all citizens have. The health of people and the health of health care depend on the lifestyle choices that people make. Premise number one. Premise number two. Individuals need a good medical home to help them achieve the best possible quality of life and death. Excellent health care depends not only on clinicians' knowledge of medical science, but also on clinicians' knowledge of their individual patients. Healthcare services, more than almost any other service, need to be customized. Customized to fit not only a patient's medical condition, but also the patient's age, mental condition, personal traits and preferences, family support system, financial capacity, and other issues. Continuity of care. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before. Continuity of care is so critical to improving the efficiency and effectiveness of healthcare in America. Because continuity of care fosters the clinician's knowledge of the patient and it fosters the patient's trust in the clinician. Individuals need a medical home, a medical home where they establish an ongoing relationship with a clinician, typically a primary care physician. The ongoing relationship enables the clinician and the other members of the care team to work with a patient on the prevention of the disease, early detection of disease, the management of chronic disease and episodic illness, and coordination of health services with specialists, specialists outside of the medical home. I believe, having been immersed in the study of healthcare in America for a number of years now, I believe the single most important decision consumers make is choosing the right doctor to be their principal partner and teacher in matters of health. Who is the right doctor? The right doctor will practice prospective medicine, prospective health care, in assessing the risk for the onset and progression of disease and work with patients in formulating a personalized strategic plan for health. The right doctor will seek to positively influence the patient's choices in eating and drinking, smoking, exercising, managing stress, parenting, taking prescribed medications. The right doctor will know when a physician possessing more specialized knowledge and expertise is needed and when the patient should be hospitalized. And just as importantly, the right doctor will know when the patient should not be hospitalized. Too many patients go to the hospital when they shouldn't. More about that later. The right doctor, at the appropriate time, will help the patient plan for and receive quality of care at the end of life. The ideal time for the patient to determine the kind of medical care to receive when end of life is near and when curative care is ineffective. The ideal time for the patient to determine the kind of medical care to receive at that, that point when end of life is near is not when the patient enters the hospital. Not then. It's before then, with the counsel and assistance of the patient's primary doctor and the support of family. 
We have a cure-driven medical system in America. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are ever going to fundamentally improve the humaneness of our healthcare system and address its excessive cost, we must effect a better balance between cure-driven health care and end-of-life health care. We must effect a better balance between the two. About 27% of Medicare's total budget goes to medical care for patients in their last year of life. 27%. And far too often that care is futile, ineffective, invasive, and painful. What is possible, however, is to help gravely ill patients better manage pain, manage anxiety, depression, insomnia, shortness of breath, and other symptoms, and in so doing, improve the quality of dying. We talk a lot about quality of life. We need to be more concerned about the quality of death. Helping patients avoid needless suffering at the end of life is a focus of palliative care and hospice care. If we invested far more resources in palliative care and hospice care, we would spend far less on health care overall. And in addition, more of the 85% of Americans who indicate in survey research that they would prefer to die at home would be able to do so instead of dying in a hospital. The right doctor will know when it's time for palliative care and hospice care. The right doctor will help patients maintain as much quality of life as possible, even when patients are dying. Premise number three, health insurance must be mandatory. And I didn't come to this premise easily. I'm a, a staunch proponent of freedom. But I've come to it after a lot of study and reflection and immersion in our healthcare system and what ails it. 47 million Americans have no health insurance. 47 million. More than 80% of the uninsured live in households where someone is employed. Millions more are underinsured, limiting their ability to buy medical services they desperately need. As one surgeon explains, we have started to see patients come in who have high deductible policies and they cannot pay the deductible. Health uninsurance exacts an unacceptable toll on individual and public health and on our health care system. Research indicates that three-fifths of uninsured people have no regular doctor, no regular medical home. Three-fifths of uninsured people, making these people much less likely to receive preventative health care or properly manage chronic health conditions. A 2006 national study found that medical treatment was put off because of costs in 68% of households without insurance compared to 21% of households with insurance. Other research documents that the absence of health insurance, not having health insurance, increases the risk significantly of early premature death. About 50% of the uninsured receive their usual medical care from high-cost emergency rooms. And research shows that Medicare patients who lacked health insurance before becoming Medicare eligible have much higher Medicare costs than those who had insurance prior to reaching Medicare age. The Institute of Medicine estimates that the U.S. could save up to $130 billion. Our country could save up to $130 billion simply by insuring people who are uninsured currently. 
We simply cannot fix health care in America until we insist on a system that extends access to essential medical care at affordable cost for every single person. We just can't do it. Now, I'm not advocating a single-payer system, which you've heard a lot about. I'm not an advocate of that. I'm not advocating a government system that provides all of the nation's health insurance. Here's what I'm advocating. I'm advocating a system in which our government, number one, mandates that all citizens have sufficient health insurance, and number two, enables those who cannot afford it to obtain it. Society will be better served by a health insurance system where individuals, employers, and government share responsibility for its funding. Health insurance is an incredibly complex topic. Here's a quick starter list of ideas for redesigning health insurance. Very quick. First, government insurance needs to be competitive with private insurance in the fees that government insurance pays so that patients with Medicaid or Medicare or other government insurance have equal access to medical care comparable to those with private insurance, which is not the case today. Second, health insurers need to enable patients' freedom of choice in selecting a clinician that is right for them. We all need the doctor that is right for us. Third, Health insurers, private and government insurers, need to pay in a way that encourages, not discourages, encourages medical effectiveness, efficiency, and innovation. For hospitals, such a system could involve bonus payments for achieving better results at a lower total cost of care. Those better results might include lower risk-adjusted patient mortality rates and higher patient satisfaction rates at a lower total cost of care. For outpatient practices, for primary care medical practices, for example, that meet certain criteria, a standard per patient fee could be paid in addition to fees for the specific services provided. The purpose of this per patient fee would be to encourage and fund critical initiatives such as preventative and patient preventative health services and patient education services. Encourage selected evening and weekend office hours. If we had that, we would prevent so many unnecessary emergency room visits, the highest cost of health care there is. This fee could encourage and fund telemedicine services, coordination of care services, implementation of electronic medical records, which we desperately need in our health care system. Only about 5% of our health care services today in this country are provided with the aid and assistance of electronic medical records. 5%. And this per patient fee could rise or fall based on measured medical outcomes and patient satisfaction. So that's the third point. Fourth point, government needs to allocate far more resources to support nonprofit community health centers that primarily serve lower income people. These community health centers provide the medical home that's so important not only for treating disease, but also for preventing it. A better funded network of community health centers across our country would create a more equitable and a more efficient healthcare system. Fifth, new affordable group health insurance plans must be developed and marketed for people without access to employer insurance, without access to government insurance, and for small businesses, many of which have left the insurance market altogether. We need to be far more innovative in health insurance than we've been. We've heard that word innovation throughout the morning, and we need it desperately in health insurance and health care in general. And sixth and finally, before I move on to my last main point, health insurance services need to become simpler and less administratively wasteful. More innovative, lower-cost policies need to be developed that include essential medical services, 
but also encourage patients to avoid unnecessary medical care. A lot of needless care being provided today. A lot of waste in our medical system today, and that's part of it. Frankly, health insurers need to be easier to do business with for doctors, but also for patients. They need to be more focused. They need to be more focused on improving the quality of health care, not just reducing the cost of health care. Premise four, the last premise, employers must broaden the meaning of healthy company. The phrase healthy company typically refers to a company's financial health. Managers need to broaden the meaning to include the health of employees. A truly healthy company is sound not only financially, but also in the physical and mental well-being of its employees. In today's economy, where car manufacturers spend more on health care than on steel, employee health is directly connected to a company's financial health. A hidden profit drain for companies is presenteeism. Don't know if you've heard that word before, presenteeism. It means that employees are present for work, but they're less productive because they're ill or preoccupied with the illness of a loved one. Dow Chemical Company has determined that presenteeism is its largest health-related economic impact, ahead of absenteeism, health insurance, and workers' compensation. As one company's HR executive put it, the only long-term effective way of reducing health costs is healthier employees. Employers need to play a major leadership role if we're going to fix health care in America. They have a strong financial incentive to do so. They have a unique opportunity to influence employees' behaviors. They have access to their employees. And they have the business smarts to be innovative in the way that we need. Companies need to make wellness part of the corporate culture while making sure that employee privacy is protected. Firms can in incorporate wellness in their cultures by encouraging healthier lifestyles through education, through access to medical assistance, and through financial, financial incentives. Companies that focus exclusively on cutting their health costs will jeopardize employees' trust. Companies that invest in a healthier workforce will strengthen their employees' trust. Imagine a company. Imagine a company that sets a goal of reducing the onset of type 2 diabetes in its workforce by 25% within five years. That that becomes a goal of the company. We're going to reduce the onset of type 2 diabetes in our workforce by 25% in five years' time. It becomes a business goal. Achieving this goal would improve employee productivity, it would reduce the company's health care spending, and it would improve the quality of life for employees. This is the way employers need to think about health care. And fortunately, an increasing number of companies are doing just that. Let me give you some examples before I close. Johnson & Johnson, Coors Brewing Company, and many other firms encourage employees to complete confidential health risk appraisals. When the appraisal indicates an employee has a health risk, professional assistance is offered. Johnson & Johnson discounts the cost of, a, of health insurance for its employees who complete their health risk appraisal, and more than 90% of employees participate in this voluntary program. Rosen Hotels, SAS Institute, Purdue Farms, and many other companies today operate their own medical clinics on their premises, on their campuses, staffed by physicians and nurses to care for employees and dependents. These services may be free or offered at a reduced fee. The rationale for these companies includes emphasizing prevention of disease and early detection of disease and reducing the amount of time employees are away, away from their desk, away from their job, visiting off-site providers. 
Many companies with on-site on medical clinics make special efforts to attract superb, superb clinicians so that employees will make the clinics their medical home. Microsoft includes physician house calls as a benefit for all of its health plan employees and dependents in, this, in the Seattle area. And the company estimated that it saved $1 million in 2007 from its physician house call program because the house call service reduced emergency room visits. Microsoft and many other firms offer comprehensive programs to help employees lose weight. Participation in these programs is always voluntary. The programs typically offer medically supervised, customized assistance in nutrition, fitness training, and behavioral therapy. The Biltmore Company in Asheville, North Carolina started its Healthy Weight Program in 2002 because an employee survey revealed that weight management was employees' top concern, number one concern. The company provides incentives for employees who, pro who progress through the, the program. For example, they provide a stipend to help purchase a gym membership. Biltmore sponsors three annual health fairs for employees and dependents that offer a variety of educational sessions. For example, preventing back injuries or nutritionally smart grocery shopping, as well as free health screenings, blood pressure, glucose, cholesterol, other types of screenings. L.L. Bean shuts down its manufacturing line three times a day for mandatory, mandatory five-minute stretches to help prevent common work-related injuries. Caterpillar, Pitney Bowes, and other companies reduce or eliminate employees' co-pays on certain drugs for chronic conditions to encourage employees to be sure and buy and take their medicine. It's simply time to cure health care. We can do it. We need to summon the will. We need to summon the courage. We do not need to spend more money on health care. We need to stop wasting it, and we need to spend it differently. We can do this. We must do this. Thank you all very much. I hope that somebody's listening. This man has a lot of, has given a lot of time and study to this issue, and I hope that Congress, I hope that business is listening. I know that I certainly enjoyed it today. Thank you very much, Dr. Barry.